to record it. So hopefully you get a chance to catch up for yesterday's excellent talk. And so I'm very excited for a second opportunity to hear Dr. Vinok talk. Um, he comes to us from the Osh Osh Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. Before that, he completed a PhD um, here in the United States at the University of Missouri, and then a postdoc at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, and his research spans everything um, from things we heard about yesterday, such as issues with um, invasive or urban, urban and domestic animals um, and movement ecology, all the way to One Health, which I believe we'll be hearing about now. So with that, I will hand it over and uh, welcome. Thanks, Julie. Uh, it's good to be back with you guys. Um, and thanks for the excellent feedback on yesterday's talk. Um, so today, uh, I'm just, I'm just going to start sharing my screen really quick. Um, okay. So today I'll be talking about some of my ongoing work. Um, some of it is, is, is published, some of it is brand new. So uh, you'll be hearing about it for the first time today. Um, well, it's a timely time to be talking about disease, isn't it? Um, we've got this hanging over our heads. Uh, and boy, what a year it's been already so far, 2020. Yeah? It's not even done with, you still have you still have an election to go through. Um, so this pandemic though, um, you know, there's a lot of people talking about wearing masks. Um, so I found something quite unusual. Uh, there was another pandemic about a hundred year or so years ago. Um, and guess what they advised back then? Wear a mask, amazing, isn't it? Uh, and yet there are still people who, um, who seem to not, uh, not think this is a good idea. Well, anyway, this pandemic and um, this virus has pretty much brought the world to a standstill. Um, it's cleaned out uh, supermarket shelves of all the toilet rolls. Uh, people across the world have been asked to stay home. Police have come out and in, in big numbers to make sure that people stay at home. Um, back home in India though, a, a rather poorly designed uh, lockdown of the economy actually resulted in one of the largest movement of humans uh, modern history has seen. So millions of people left cities and started walking back home. Uh, in the midst of this pan pandemic or trying to find whatever transport they could to get back to their villages. Um, so was this pandemic, was it, you know, did it, did it hit us out of the blue? The fact is that it didn't. If you look at this paper from 2007, and I'll read these lines to you, they are rather prescient. Uh, the presence of a large, this is right at the end of the paper, uh, this 2000 paper by 2007 paper by Cheng et al. The presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV -CoV like viruses in horseshoe bats together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in Southern China is a time bomb. The possibility of the reemergence of SARS and other novel viruses from animals or, lab or laboratories and, for the, and therefore the need for preparedness should not be ignored. In fact, many other scientists have for more than a decade been warning of exactly this, that there will be another pandemic, that we should be prepared for this. Now, why have they been warning, warning us about this? What is the evidence base that seems to suggest that uh, another pandemic would, or that this such a pandemic as this one um, would have occurred and that we should be prepared for another one to occur? Um, going forward. Well, um, some of it is from the nature of the infectious diseases that we deal with. Um, most of the diseases that are emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases across the world 
almost 75% of them are zoonotic. So zoonotic, of course, means uh, that their primary reservoirs are in wild animals and that they can spill over to humans. Um, sorry, the primary reservoirs in animals, not just wild animals, but in animals in general, and that they can spill over to humans. Now, this, this, uh, this spillover pathway can take several forms. It can either be a direct spillover from a wild reservoir to a human, but that rather rarely happens. Usually there is an intermediary host or an amplifying host that's often a domestic animal. Um, very often and with many, many diseases, there are also vectors that are involved, such as fleas, ticks, mosquitoes, mites. Um, all of you folks in the US are, are quite familiar with things like Lyme disease, for instance, um, or, or West Nile virus. These are vector-borne diseases. Um, and as our, um, as our interference or as, uh, as, as we change uh, natural systems or as we uh, disrupt natural transmission dynamics or fragment natural habitats, the chance of emergence of these uh, pathogens increases, the risk of emergence increases, and the risk of us contracting these pathogens increases. The third factor that can lead from a localized emergence to a pandemic is, of course, our globalized society. We are now able to travel very rapidly from anywhere in the world to anywhere else. So what should have been a um, an epidemic or an outbreak that was localized to China or even South, Southeast Asia um, very rapidly spread across the world because we do massive amounts of trade and business and travel between all these countries. Um, so one really asks then, what are or what are the factors that lead to the risk of these uh, diseases, the risk of these emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases? Well, again, we don't have to ask these questions for too long because uh, you know, over the last decade or so, scientists have been studying exactly this problem. So if you take um, factors such as biodiversity hotspots, so patterns, global patterns such as biodiversity hotspots, and you add that with human population density and livestock density, those, those three things put together um, can result in, in a fairly high predictive ability to show where the, the highest risk for, the, uh, for emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases comes from. Uh, so as you can see, places in, uh, in South China and the Indian subcontinent, South Asia, are amongst the hottest of hotspots. Uh, and if you start looking at individual pathogens or individual zoonotic diseases, some of the most important ones in the modern world, you'll, you'll see that this pattern seems to, um, seems to be mirrored quite closely. So let's take one of the oldest known zoonotic diseases, rabies. Now, this is the topic of, uh, of, my, of my own research. I uh, alluded to it briefly yesterday when I was talking about domestic dogs. Um, so we, the global burden of, of rabies is estimated to be about 60,000 deaths per annum. Okay? And India uh, accounts for almost a third of these deaths. So we have about 20,000 human deaths per year. Um, and 95% of these rabies cases come from the bite of domestic dogs, uh, of which we have a lot, and uh, they do bite a lot as well. So 20 million dog bite cases per year. That's, 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 that's a serious number. Um, now rabies itself is, um, is a really dreaded disease. And over the years, people have, um, have come up with fantastic um, uh, they're, they're, they've let their imaginations run wild. For example, uh, there was this zombie apocalypse that's, that's been triggered by rabies. This is, of course, not real news, um, but this is what the imagination comes to. 
Now, rabies is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, its manifestation in humans can be quite, uh, quite severe, and people often have to be at the end stages of rabies. People often have to have to be restrained uh, because they suffer from acute um, neurological failure. They're not able to withstand any um, any strong stimulus such as light or or even wind. Um, because they have a severe gag reflex, because their, their uh, nervous system is, is, is sort of failing to control their behavior anymore. They, um, when they see water or food, they can have uh, violent uh, responses. So it's uh, in, in, the, in the popular imagination, this is called hydrophobia. Um, eventually encephalitis, coma, uh, and seizure result in death. So this is one of the deadliest known diseases uh, to humankind. It, uh, if you've got rabies, you're pretty much guaranteed to die from it. Um, but the origins of rabies itself are, and because of, the, of these violent symptoms, the origins of rabies are quite, in, uh, people have written about it in the ancient world. So for instance, the Greek, the, the word rabies uh, and the name of the viral genus Lisa or the group of viruses that it comes from, the Lisa viruses, um, uh, it comes from the Greek word uh, pro, meaning violent and rabies itself is supposed to come from rabies or rabio, which means rage, madness or anger. Um, some scholars actually uh, assign the origin of the word rabies to come from the Indian language, Sanskrit, uh, from rabhasa, which again, it means to do violence. Now, there is, some, uh, there is some historical evidence to suggest that one of the oldest descriptions of rabies came in this book written by, or purported to, be, to have been written by uh, the sage Maharishi Shushrut uh, sometime in the period 1500 BC. Although the book itself, the Shushruta Samhita was written somewhere between 1750 to 500 BC. It contains a very accurate description of rabies. It says, if the patient becomes exceedingly frightened at the sight or mention of the very name of water, he should be understood to have been afflicted with jalatrisa, which is hydrophobia, and be deemed to have been doomed. Of course, this was back then, so the, uh, the cures for rabies were also quite fanciful. Uh, you, it, was, it was suggested that if you made a paste of uh, various herbs and other medicinal plants, uh, you could draw out the poison um, and, and uh, uh, the wind would drive away the cluster of uh, the, that the, the poison would be driven away from from the from the body as easily as as wind drives away clusters of clouds. Clouds. Um, it was really only during the pre-independence era once Louis Pasteur um, found the vaccine for for rabies uh, that we we started getting a handle on this on this dreaded disease. Now, this also was one of the first vaccines to be invented. Um, many of you will have read that, um, that Louis Pasteur, uh, uh, you know, tried this, this out on, on a young boy who, uh, who, who had been bitten by a dog and, and uh, who had almost no other way of, of uh, survival. But in, in, in reality, Louis Pasteur did a whole series of experiments um, to first determine the efficacy of the vaccine that he was using before he did the human trial. Uh, in independent, pre-independent India, when the British were in charge of India, they took rabies pretty seriously. And they in fact set up several Pasteur institutes all across India because rabies was of significant health concern for the British garrisons that were, uh, that were set up all over India. And often what, what would happen is the British would take their dogs back with them to India, back with them to the UK, 
and inadvertently once in a while a, a rabid dog would uh, would get transported back to the uk and introduce rabies back in that population so they really wanted to control the uh, uh, the spread of rabies both within india as well as prevent the the incursion of rabies from uh, india back to the uk uh, one of the uh, surgeon generals of the of the british uh, of, of the british colonial government av lingard uh, even pioneered the set, the setting up or the development of several new biologicals and all of this work uh, is being um, has just been published or has just been submitted for for review and is available as a preprint from one of my phd students uh, shri jis radha krishnan who's done a really a uh, fascinating historical review of the importance of of rabies control in uh, in british india um if you were to google rabies then most likely you would get a photo that looks like this of a dog um growling angry or one that's that's salivating and foaming at the mouth now i don't know how many of you uh, may have ever seen a rabid dog uh, it's not a pleasant sight but i'm going to show you a few videos um and normally what i do to a live audience is is make them guess which of these animals is potentially rabid but of course i can't do this so i'm going to give uh, i'm going to give the secret away um all of these are rabid okay but let's start so i showed this yesterday this is a, this is typically what you'd expect from a rabid dog a very violent um you know biting at anything that comes within reach of it okay um but occasionally you could also have very calm looking animals such as this puppy who's uh, just playfully nibbling at a little bit of newspaper uh, and in in every other sense seems perfectly normal look it's sitting down there uh perfectly calm uh friendly even um and you know you just want to go and and pick it up and cuddle it but unfortunately this pup is rabid as well you see there's no salivation there's none of that foaming in the mouth okay uh, here we have another very very sick looking dog clearly it's sick um and it's in a lot of distress and a lot of pain um it could you know this condition could be due to various other reasons as well but this one was clearly rabid uh, this is another photo another video i showed you yesterday of a dog in the street um showing this very typical disoriented behavior um it isn't even so doesn't even seem to be afraid of water as you can see that it's actually uh trying to go and and drink water um but it's just completely unable to do so it's got no coordination whatsoever um this final photo i want to show you is is of somebody's pet dog this is this is a labrador retriever um and you can see that you know it looks perfectly normal except for the fact that it's actually got lockjaw and lockjaw is one of the symptoms of rabies it's probably not been able to put its tongue back inside for days now um and unfortunately this dog uh, also died very soon afterwards but uh, you know it it was it tested positive for rabies now rabies is considered as a poster child for uh what's called one health okay and we'll talk about one health in a little bit um there is there is an ongoing conference uh united against rabies because world rabies day is is just coming up um and there is a there is a plan to eliminate rabies by 2030 so zero by 2030 is the goal or several organizations including the world health organization the oie the fao um and several other ngos and and governments across the world have come up with a plan to eliminate rabies and one health is the basis for this for this program so what is one health one health is basically um a framework that recognizes that human health uh is is intrinsically connected to animal health and the environmental health okay and it envisages that people who care about each of these things will collaboratively collaboratively uh, and in in a transdisciplinary manner 
work together at multiple levels to solve some of these problems, especially for zoonosis. Um, so how do you operationalize a One Health program? Well, one of the things you can do is surveillance, One Health surveillance. And One Health surveillance consists of several uh, targeted monitoring strategies, which involve sampling wildlife, livestock, as well as human health for the same uh, for the same kind of disease, okay? Um, and as, as I said, it is particularly relevant for zoonosis. So if you know that there's a, there's a particular pathogen, pathogen that's emerging from, uh, from either from domestic animals or from wildlife, then it's best to start monitoring those animals because those are sentinel species. So I'll give an example of a One Health surveillance that, uh, that we carried out in a large metropolis um, in India. So this is Pune city in Western India. It's uh, not too far from Mumbai or Bombay as it was earlier, earlier known. Um, so this city has about 8 million people. It's uh, the size of the city is about hundred square kilometers. I was very fortunate to meet up with uh, this team of really amazing people who work in Pune city. Uh, they are an animal welfare organization they're called rescue um, and uh, they they uh, they've been for several years uh, rescuing animals from the street treating them so they run a veterinary service they run a veterinary hospital it's a charitable uh, charitable organization um, and what they've done is they've devised a really wonderful uh, online reporting system based on uh, both a web a web application as well as a mobile phone application. And in that you can go and if you see a, uh, a dog or any other animal that, is, that, is, that requires help, you can go there and take a photo of this and upload it on, onto rescue system and they'll immediately send an ambulance or somebody to come and pick up that animal. So I started collaborating with them and I gave them these uh, rapid test kits so these are lateral flow assays, um, which based on, so once, you know, so you, we take two kinds of samples to test. One is um, before the animal dies, you take a salivary swab and, uh, and you, and you uh, use a dial, provide a diluent and then you, you, you can test, you can perform the test on this kit. And once the animal dies, then you can do a, a minimally invasive uh, brain biopsy and, and uh, take out a small bit of sample and, re and repeat the test. So what we found was that uh, the saliva, so the saliva is not a very good measure of uh, positivity for rabies. So it's, it gives a lot of false negatives, but the brain samples are, uh, um, are, are very accurate. Um, and these kits themselves are really good good to work with. We've also validated these kits using, um, using RT-PCR. Um, so, so we know that these kits work well and they give results in within 10 minutes. So what do these results look like? So I'll show you, every, I'll show you our, our monitoring um, results from one year. We've been doing this for the last three years now, but I'll just show you one year's results. I showed some of this yesterday as well. Um, so each of these red dogs uh, represents one rabid animal. And this is within the city of, uh, within Pune city itself, okay? And as you can see, um, it was quite an outbreak. Um, most people in Pune city were not aware of this. They did not realize. In fact, the people who we worked with in rescue did not realize the scale of the problem. Um, so this was quite alarming for them as well, especially because they had been doing vaccination drives through the city for several years now. And despite all their efforts, they were still getting such a huge outbreak of rabid dogs. Um, we found that, uh, you know, we had, we, te we tested over 318 suspected rabies cases out of uh, more than 6,000 animals that are brought to their, uh, to their rescue center in a year. Uh, of which 167, uh, almost more than half tested positive we even had three bovine cases, so uh, cattle that were bitten by, by dogs. Um, 
140 of these were what would be normally uh, categorized as furious cases. Now, it's also important to keep in mind that not all rabies cases would even be reported by the people. Many of these animals, especially if they are what's called the dumb form of rabies, where they would just quietly lie in a corner and die, would not even be reported. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Also, as I mentioned in my talk yesterday, um, we had 32 people that were, were bitten by confirmed rabid animals. Uh, thankfully, there were zero human cases reported thus far. So we analyzed this data a little bit more. Um, and we found that there were a few hotspots in space, um, but not so much in time. So the rabies cases weren't concentrating. Um, they, were, they were fairly evenly spread out in time. So there's not much of a gap between subsequent cases uh, in, in, these, in, these, in these regions. Um, so we wanted to find out what happens outside the city because uh, it's, it's in the villages, in the rural areas that most of the problem occurs. And dogs continue to be the main reservoir of rabies in those areas as well. And since we didn't have as good a surveillance system in place there, we decided to get more hands-on. So we basically went door to door and we caught um, several hundred dogs and we fit a subset of them with GPS collars so about 35 animals were fit with, uh, with GPS collars. And we wanted to see what their movement patterns look like. So um, the movement ecologists out there will be happy to see some of these uh, movement, movement, uh, movement tracks of animals. So these are results of some of our dogs uh, doing their thing, they're walking around. Of course, it's been speeded up quite a bit. But if you notice something, you will see, if you look closely, you will see that the animals in the village, the dogs which are, uh, which are in the human settlement itself, barely move. They're only confined to the village itself, except for this one or two dogs that go outside uh, once in a while. But most of the dogs are uh, confined themselves to a very small area. And I'm going to go back to the previous one. And you can see that the, the dogs in the previous slide, um, some of them have really large movements. Okay, They move over much larger areas. Now, these are the dogs that live in farmlands. They don't live in the village. Okay, So there almost seems to be two different behaviors, uh, movement behaviors being exhibited by these animals. And you can see that there are significant differences in both their uh, their steplins, their mean steplins, as well as their net displacement, and uh, a huge difference in their home range size as well. Um, now, interestingly, this landscape is also shared by several other species. So we have a whole host of native carnivore species that are found in this uh, in the same landscape. So we have uh, jackals, golden jackal, jungle cats, and, uh, and Indian foxes. So we, we went out and we put GPS collars on these animals as well. And this is what those, the, move, the movement of these animals looks like. So these are foxes doing their thing and you have jackals. And then you have a third species called the jungle cat. Now the jungle cat uh, overlaps with both foxes and jackals but also doesn't mind being in human habitations. So this is the nearby town of Baramati. And you can see uh, the jungle cat going right inside town, walking amongst the buildings and so on. Okay, So it's almost like an urban jungle cat. Um, so once we started putting all these, all these data together, um, we started looking for overlap. So in this case, you can see the, the trajectory of one um, one jackal in red and all of these dogs around it. Okay, And these are just a subset of dogs. And you can clearly see that there's overlap in their movement patterns. Uh, so if we, if we uh, zoom out from the very fine scale uh, movement patterns and look at broader uh, overlap patterns such as home range overlap, 
we see that clearly there's a lot of potential for overlap between domestic dogs. So in this case, in this map, you can see all the, the black circles are domestic dogs um, and the, the colored ones are for the other species. We can also depict, depict this in 3D and we see that there's a high potential for interaction. Um, so what, is, what does all this mean? And what's, so what? So what if all of this happens? Well, you know, as I said, um, there's a plan for zero by 2030. Um, and that plan involves mass vaccination. So most of the, uh, most of the, um, uh, the global alliance for rabies control and most governments um, think that um, vaccinating dogs against rabies is the way to go, okay? So uh, if you'll see, you'll see campaigns such as this one uh, from, from African countries where people bring their own dogs to central point vaccination uh, stations and they get vaccinated and then they take, take them home. And this is a very um, successful strategy in these landscapes. But this kind of a strategy is unlikely to succeed in a place like India, where most of the dogs, um, where even, even the so-called own dogs, the owners are not able to catch them. So you have to go out and individually catch these dogs. So there's a group called Mission Rabies that's been doing a lot of work in some Indian states, the UK based charity. And uh, they spend a lot of money uh, and time and effort catching dogs to vaccinate them. Okay. So um, my colleagues and I wondered whether there's another way we could do this without having to spend so much money. So we came up with a hypothesis. We, our hypothesis was that um, rabies spreads not from rural areas to urban areas, but rather it's the other way around. That urban areas, because of their high density of dog populations, now in India, some cities can have dog populations as high as 400 dogs per square kilometer, okay? So these high density dog populations could be the source of rabid dogs. And this could be spilling over into the um, peri-urban or rural interface uh, through what we suspect could be a link population, okay? And once in the rural interface, there could be a maintenance of rabies is either, uh, either in the domestic dog population that's in the rural areas or wild animals could also be playing a role in the maintenance of rabies or certainly in the transmission dynamics of rabies from one place to the other. Um, some of these questions are actually best answered. So you've already seen now that uh, a city like Pune uh, has a huge outbreak of, of rabies. So that part of our uh, hypothesis seems to work seems to hold, okay? So we took those samples. Um, so these are, these are again our samples from Pune city, as well as some samples from the surrounding areas, okay? And we did some genomic analysis with it because that's what's gonna give us some real insights into, into these dynamics. And we found, and this is, this is, this is new stuff, um, we collaborated with, uh, with some folks from University of Idaho to do, do some of this analysis. And we found that um, there were more than one strain of rabies circulating within Pune city itself, okay? This gives us confidence that, uh, that urban areas, again, it supports our hypothesis and gives us confidence that urban areas may be harboring old, that basically the, the rabies is not continuously reintroduced into an urban population but rather it's circulating within the population for a long period of time. And some of, these, um, some of these strains could have been there for almost 20 or 25 years. Um, we also found evidence for transmission chains for both uh, short and long transmission chains and transmission chains that were, so they were both spatially um, long, so they were, uh, in terms of their, their aerial distance, you could follow them. So you could connect one, uh, one, uh, one rabid dog, passing it on to another, to another. There could even be something missing in between. 
Um, we also found temporary uh, uh, chains. So in a, within a, short, a small area, we found several very closely related, uh, related uh, uh, rabies individuals, suggesting that uh, we might not have a, we, we can't identify a chain itself, but that these were all clo related, close related in time to one or two events. Now this, um, we, can, we can now take all of these data and we can start creating models of transmission to try and fit into that hypothetical structure that we have. So this is something that we've just started working with. Uh, this is a paper that's, uh, that's currently in review. Uh, so we created an agent-based model uh, of a dog interface. So the, one of the first things we did was we wanted to see what would a um, neuter, uh, a, you know, like a uh, trap neuter vaccinate release program look like in terms of its efficacy. So we simulated various scenarios and we found that um, only when we make, only when we have very unrealistic uh, assumptions behind dog population dynamics, for example, there's no immigration, it's a closed population. Um, the number of surgical interventions that are done per month are very high. So for example, in this scenario, you have to do something like 750 surgeries per month in a closed population population and that all dogs are accessible. Only then do you see a, a drastic reduction in the dog population. Basically the dog population goes more or less down to zero. Um, and surprisingly though, even in this scenario, we found that if you, if you um, uh, couple vaccination with, with uh, sterilization, your uh, annual rate of vaccination of, of your population coverage of vaccination does not exceed 30% of the population in any given year, when in fact you need to be, uh, you need to be touching 70% of the population for any given year. Okay, so um, this may, leads us to believe that CNVR as a, um, as a rabies control measure may not, may not work. So what could work? Well, we're gonna use these models now and try and find out if we can, uh, if, if, uh, we can simulate different, uh, different forms of, of vaccination. For example, it could be a ring vaccination around cities to see if, um, uh, if we vaccinated this link population, um, then you could break those transmission chains from the city to the rural interface. Now, as I said before, it's the rural areas that have most of the burden of rabies. So more than 93% of uh, human cases, the human fatalities come from rural areas. In cities, uh, most people have access to good uh, post exposure prophylaxis and therefore they're protected. Um, and this pattern of poorer people uh, suffering the most from these, these diseases is repeated across the world. So for example, if you see this map that links poverty with likely zoonosis hotspots, you again see a very tight correlation. Okay, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, all um, Southeast Asia, some of the poorest countries in the world are also hotspots for zoonosis. Um, and it's because there's an intersection in most of these areas of very high human density high biodiversity uh, that leads to the increasing risk of emergence of, of, of pathogens and countries like India are particularly vulnerable. It's also when people um, access livelihood benefits from forests and other natural landscapes that they then become increasingly exposed to zoonotic diseases. So um, I'll shift gear now to another zoonotic disease and um, show you a framework where I worked with a host of partner institutions uh, to examine, a design, again, this is ongoing work, but to examine a scenario where you could optimize benefits that people receive from, uh, from forests for their livelihoods while still minimizing impacts from uh, zoonotic diseases. So the example we explored here is a rather obscure disease is called the Kyasunur Falls disease. 
Now, this is a tick bone disease, and I'll, I'll describe it to you a little bit now. Uh, it's, uh, it's a flavivirus that, that has the potential to cause fairly debilitating hemorrhagic disease. And it was first discovered um, by scientists in the early 1950s. And there's a fascinating story about that. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a historical insight into that as well. The people who were most at risk from this disease were tribal groups, uh, resident and migratory farmers, plantation workers, and people who did forestry work. Okay, um, this, uh, this disease has a fairly complex transmission cycle, and, and we'll explore that in a little bit. Um, what you can also see from this graph is that in recent years, there has been a massive uptick in the number of cases that have been reported. Okay? And also the geographic spread of this disease has increased. It used to be first concentrated just here in, this, in the state of Karnataka uh, in Southern India. But over the last few years, it has now spread further south as well as moved up north. Now, whether it's actually spread or whether it is only being detected now is, uh, is something that's left that's open to debate, okay? Um, the search for this, or the search for the cause of this disease is really fascinating. Um, and it started in the 1950s, where a team of international and national scientists came together, okay, and did some really, really path breaking, one health related work. Now, this was a true multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary team uh, working together to understand what was causing this mysterious disease. So they went out in, into these forest habitats, they, they looked for ticks, um, they caught monkeys, they did autopsies on monkeys. Um, this, 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 um, uh, this virus is also called monkey fever um, because it affects monkeys and I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, they went and sampled the, the tribal populations uh, in these areas, they even took uh, monkeys on, on a leash and made them walk through the forest to see uh, if they would attract ticks and whether they would then get, fall sick from those tick bites. So this is what they found. They found that um, some species of ticks, especially these soft body ticks, um, mostly from the Haemophysalis uh, uh, and the Ixodis uh, genera, uh, tend to be the main uh, reservoirs or main, main vectors of this, of this virus. Uh, the ticks themselves have a multi-stage life cycle where they go from uh, a larva to a nymph to an adult. And uh, at different stages, different small mammals, birds, um, and large mammals may be the host for the, uh, for the ticks themselves. Uh, if a monkey gets infected by, an by, by this virus, then it generally tends to develop a very high viremia and tick loads increase. And that is then passed on to the ticks that are, uh, the, the virus is then passed on to the ticks, are high levels of virus passed on to the ticks, um, which when they metamorphose and, and start looking for their next blood meal, and if they come across a human, bite a human, uh, transmit the virus, then the human tends to get sick, okay? But the, since that research was done in the 50s and 60s, um, very little was done after that. People suddenly seem to have forgotten about this, this disease, mainly because a vaccine was developed um, and was started being um, used quite, quite, quite widespreadly uh, in quite a widespread manner uh, across the Western hearts. And so the number of cases really reduced and therefore the interest in this disease wa uh, waned. But as you can see of late, there was, there's been uptick in the number of cases. So um, this is where we came in and we want to now dissect some of these findings a little bit better. Okay, we wanted to see at each stage what, what are the risk factors. Okay, uh, is it just Haemophysalis ticks or other or are other ticks uh, responsible as well? Um, what what role do rodents play in the transmission of this of this disease? Why is it that some people who have never been into the forest 
especially women who are working at home, also getting infected by Casanova Falls disease because it doesn't fit into this monkey fever thing, you know, the dead monkey, uh, somebody coming across a dead monkey and ticks from the dead monkey uh, or the hot zone around the dead monkey, uh, ticks infecting people walking. Uh, we, we started finding some loopholes in that story. So we wanted to come in and investigate some of this. And um, we, we constituted a fairly formidable interdisciplinary team uh, consisting of veterinarians, ecologists, social scientists, um, uh, traditional, uh, traditional uh, me medicinal practitioner, practitioners, uh, tribal health workers, public health workers, uh, and, uh, and epidemiologists. Okay. Uh, if you want more de details about this project, you can go to our website. It's called the Monkey Fever Risk uh, Program. And you can and you can read more about it, but I'll just give you a, a brief background of what kind of work we're doing here uh, before I end. So this is the kind of landscape that this um, that this disease is found in. Um, so here you see a paddy field uh, adjacent to a forest, a primary forest. There's also some plantations, areca nut plantations embedded in there. There's some banana. So people work these landscapes. So we wanted to find out in each of these areas, what are the risk, risk, what do the risky landscapes look like? So we went out and we started sampling for ticks. We caught rodents, we sampled livestock. We also went out and put GPS tags on the livestock uh, to see which habitats they were, because the livestock are really important in the cycle because they serve as hosts for adult ticks. Okay, and so they contribute to uh, ticks to the density of ticks in the landscape directly. Okay, we also did some. We also uh, created some novel techniques to understand human behavior, how human behavior could be contributing to the risk risk factors. So we um, we followed uh, people around while they were going about their daily business. Okay, and then the person in white would sort of be like uh, would be the tick attractor. Okay, and then we would comb them and look for ticks. So we wanted to see which of these habitats or which of these landscapes that people are walking through uh, where they are most at risk from contracting ticks. Okay. Um, so why are these interdisciplinary approaches needed? Um, the reason is because often the focus uh, in most of these investigations is on a single set of processes that drive risk. It could be a social factor or an eco uh, ecological one or from a medical point of view and only an epidemiological one, okay? Um, the current tools for these uh, that we have for tick-borne diseases focus mostly on environmental hazards and they often neglect some of the behavioral and social processes that drive exposure. So this is what we are trying to, uh, trying to understand through this program. Um, Sometimes the intervention programs are also not linked at the scale, appro the appropriate scale to the sources of these epidemics and ecosystem use. So what we wanted to ask was, how do these social and ecological risk factors come together? Okay, how do they vary across the landscape and how do they link to forest structure across these affected landscapes? And so we built a few models based on the data that we collected, okay, and came up with a decision support tool that allowed us to uh, first create risk maps. So this is a paper that's just been published recently where we created a predicted uh, risk map for KFT occurrence. And uh, we found that this map um, did well uh, and was able to predict in uh, this year's uh, outbreak in areas that were uh, previously, that had never, that had previously not seen an outbreak. Um, so we hope to then take these kinds of programs and expand them to various other kinds of uh, zoonotic diseases. Uh, and this is likely to get a huge boost in India in the next few years, because the government has, um, has just announced a national mission uh, to look at One Health and zoonosis. Um, the, the various components of this mission will, will uh, we'll have a full One Health framework, and we hope that a large amount of money will be put into this program um, 
to set up a, a series of, of sentinel surveillance sites across India uh, to be able to start doing, you know, to, to look at both the existing disease interfaces that we already have, okay, but also start doing the horizon scanning uh, to make sure that we don't, we're not caught napping the next time, uh, uh, you know, really dangerous zoonotic diseases, uh, disease uh, emerges in one of these highly saturated interfaces. Um, with that, I'll end my talk. I do want to acknowledge uh, lots of partners, lots of funding institutions, uh, collaborators, research team members uh, who, have, who have helped make all of this work happen. Uh, and with that, I'll end and I'll take any questions if there are. Thank you.